30 cities and more than 70 international companies, projects, groups. His name is Mattis Wackernagel. Good evening, superheroes. My pension depends on your success. <laughs> so I'm very vested here, and I'm very excited to be here because you may be the most important audience. Uh, the reason is that I would like you to introduce yourself to your neighbors and actually write the answer on your tag here. And the question is, and I'll give you some time to say, how old will you be in 2050? So when you talk to your neighbor, you say, you wouldn't say, I'm Matis. I would say that. You say your name. You may not know each other. And then you say, I will be X years old. And then maybe you want to say also why you're here. Why did we take some time to introduce each other? Yeah. Do you know your neighbor? Do that now. Did he, did he calculate your age? I bet many of you now, the, the years you put on may be less than I'm old today. You know, I'm 55 and you think, how can you ever get 55? That's so old, what a crime. But actually at 55, you still feel quite vital. You know, it's kind of, I can still bicycle. My mother, is turning 90. Last week I went bicycling with her. So that's, I'll be younger than my mother is now, you know? So anyhow, so that as a context. Why One Planet Prosperity? Actually, it's a very, very easy choice. There's a choice between One Planet Prosperity, because One Planet is not really shifting that much, and One Planet Misery. Then you have to think about it and say, which one do I want to choose? And I think today I've chose One Planet Prosperity. And I would like to talk a bit about that. So, but before that, I think the reason we are here is because we love to change the world. And what I find useful about myself is become clear about why. And that's perhaps a little gift I want to give you and then see how that applies to your life. It's being clear about two fires that we carry. One fire is the hell fire. It's the fire about what really annoys me, what gets me like, totally upset, you know, so what do I want to be different? But that's not enough. You also need to understand what's drawing you. What do you want to be different in the world? The log fire, you know? And once you can become clear about what these two things are, you can articulate it, you can tell it to your friends, you can build community around it, and that's giving give your energy. So what I want to do today is not so much dig into hellfire and to campfire, but give you some tools to help you kind of put your power into place once you're clear what you want to achieve. And it's about what comes out of my hellfire. My hellfire is kind of our voraciousness to eat up the planet, our commitment to eat up the planet, and even worse, to do as if it wasn't a problem. And so how do we re react to it? Essentially, the way I see the world, and most of it, is that it's a pretty simple proposition. We live on an amazing spaceship, the biggest spaceship we know. You know it's kind of called planet Earth. And you will be the spaceship commanders, whether you like it or not. That's, that's your thing. And when you live on a spaceship, a very important question is to understand how well your life support system works. Do you have enough oxygen on your spaceship? Do you have enough food, enough water, enough waste absorption capacity? And that's actually, if you are in a spaceship, the, uh, the big, most limiting factor immediately is not even how much oxygen they have, but how much carbon dioxide they can sequester. Because if not, they don't live very well. So what I would like to do is go exactly through this thinking and say, First, we need to understand how big are we actually? How big is the human enterprise compared to this planet? Why does that matter? And then if you understand that, where is the power? And I think the power we have is not so much being able to bribe people, we don't have enough money, not giving them more information because they have all the information, but focusing on key misunderstandings. If we can eradicate misunderstandings that hold us back from living even better, that's where the transformational power is, and then looking at how we can turn that into success. Now, how big are we? 
and I'm starting with the biology lesson. It's a paper that came out this year, quite beautiful. It shows the distribution of biomass on the planet. To the left, you see all of the living biomass on the planet, and most of it is plants. Animals take a very, very small part of it because it takes a lot of plant life to support animals. And then when you look at the animals, just kind of this little speck, what you see most of them are spiders and insects. You know? uh, a big part, mollusks, like the snails, and, uh, and, and then you, over, over there, like nematodes and annelids, annelids. These are worms. Then you look at the vertebrates. There are a lot of fish, but actually most of the fish are deep ocean fish that live long lives, and you cannot harvest them very quickly. The birds, very small. And what's quite shocking then, if you look at all the vertebrates overall, on land, Humans are about a quarter to a third of all the vertebrates on the land. Livestock is about twice as big as people, and then the wild vertebrates on land, and even if you include the birds, about four to five percent of the overall biomass of all the vertebrates. That shows somehow how dominant we have become as a species. Another way to look at how big we have become is obviously the climate angle. How many of you have heard of Paris? I will use this context to also test to what extent you should have fired your professors because I'm kind of trying to find out about the basics. What do we know? What did they teach you about climate change? Something very basic. I think most of you will know what's the goal that Paris set. The climate goal is to be under two degrees Celsius. You know, that's, you've taught that, yeah. No? So that's pretty much known. Now the question is, what does that mean in terms of carbon concentration in the atmosphere? How much carbon can we have in the atmosphere in order not to exceed the two degrees Celsius goal? Have you, have you been taught that? Yeah. So you can look IPCC reports. It's actually, the answer is 450 ppms, parts per million, CO2 equivalent. Hmm? Now the big question is, where are we at now? Did they teach you that? 400? Other guesses? 410? Other guesses? Mm -hmm. Okay, you can go to US government websites NOAA, for example, and look at the following. It's actually 493 CO2 equivalent. So there's a big of a gap there. So that tells us that the budget left for carbon is pretty small, that the size of the human economy is quite significant. But let's just simplify and say, let's just look at CO2 as if there was no other ones, because most of the IPCC communication does as if there's no other, CO, no, no other greenhouse gases than CO2. And then we can do another question. How much are we building up CO2 per year? It's about 2 ppms per year, and a very simple calculation will tell you if you take 450 minus 408, then you can see how much is left, divide by 2, you get about 20 years worth of carbon budget. You, know, you can either allocate it by just saying let's continue straight or go slowly down, but there's no real argument that we can use carbon beyond 2050. Figueres, also excluding other greenhouse gases, came to the same conclusion. We can wait a little longer, then we have to go down steeper. You know, that's kind of what the, the implication is. So essentially, by I ask you to put out your, your idea, how old will you be in 2050, is that there's no real argument. If you want to comply with Paris, that by the time you will be that age, hopefully, we won't use fossil fuels. Zero CO2, way before 2050. And that's kind of the chemical formula of the world. Now, is it possible? There are a number of studies. McKinsey did studies, Drawdown did studies that shows it's actually technically feasible by the technology of today and even financially viable. So that's good news. Why does it matter? And I would like you to vote on these very questions and say, okay, do you want Paris to succeed? Probably most people say, yeah, we want it to succeed. Do you think it's possible technological? You are technical people, you know, yeah, it's possible. And then you think, is it probable that it will happen? And then the hands go a little bit down. And, and I think that tells us about 
the challenge that we are facing is not so much technological, perhaps much more psychological, that we struggle with the ambivalence and the anxiety about knowing that there's a big gap. And I think that's where we need to focus on with people. It's not so much about the information they don't have, but so much more about the anxiety and the ambivalence that they carry. Now, I think we can reduce anxiety and ambivalence if we help people understand better where we have key misconceptions about the world. That actually, if you overcome them, make solving the problem much easier. And I would like to go through those misconceptions uh, just here. What are key misconceptions in the world? You may not know, but most people in decision-making power implicitly believe that resources are not very important or even a net negative. That's being taught in schools when you study and development economics, for example, they teach you more about something called the resource curse. Have you heard that? Basically implying that countries that have access to resources have a harder time to develop uh, than those like where I come from, Switzerland, with no resources and people work hard and then you suddenly make money. Now, I have lived in many countries. They work much harder in other countries than Switzerland. That's not the reason. There are other reasons. Um, so, so resources are really significant. You can gold plate your car. You can put diamonds on your car. If you don't have energy to drive your car, it's not going to move. Resources are really significant. What the second misconception is, let me take it actually a step further with that misconception. You may have heard of a bank called the World Bank based in Washington DC. They put beautiful children on their reports. And they summarized also, what's the wealth of nation? They summarized and said there are three types of wealth. There's built area, a built wealth, so buildings like here. There's human capital, there's institutions and our health, and there's natural capital. And they come to the amazing conclusion that the planet is worth only 9% of our total assets. Now, if you were on a spaceship, which you actually are, and your spaceship is overused and overwhelmed, what would you want more? More iPads or more spaceships? You know, what's, what's really more important? And truly, can you say that there is a substitutability between these types of capitals. Can we just draw down natural capital more if we improve a little bit human capital? A friend of me told me very simply, the only people who can meaningfully substitute human capital and natural capital are cannibals. That makes sense? Yeah. So, so recognizing kind of the financial value and saying, how can a subsystem called the human economy be worth more than the system? It's kind of scary as an idea because it's not. So anyhow, that just shows that deep embedded, even though we say we value it, we undervalue natural resources. We do as if they're not important. So resources are significant because we are physical beings. But then very often when people say, what are resources? They would say, yeah, it's the non-renewable resources. It's the depletion of the oil and the ores that is really limiting. And I would say they are limited, but even more limiting, I would say, is the living, the biological resources. Because oil is not limited by how much is on the ground. It's limited, but not limiting. Much more limiting is how much we can burn that can be absorbed by the biosphere. So again, the biosphere becomes the limiting factor physically for our ability to live on the planet. So it's the biological resources that are limited. When we recognize that, then people say, okay, the biological resources are limited, but let's boost them. Let's have green revolutions and everything will be fine. When we look historically at the trends, we have been able to increase the productivity on the planet through intensification about 20% as the average of the planet, or about 30% actually, about 30% overall. But human demand in the same time period has about tripled. So if you bet on horses, you go betting, which horse do you bet on, the slow horse or the fast horse? It's a rhetorical question. But um, we, it seems rhetorical, but it's actually that we are doing a lot on the slow horse. Um, anyhow, now the green line says what's totally available. You may remember there are other species sharing the planet with us, about 100 million other species. They may need space too. You know, so should we use everything or should we leave some for other species? Up to us to choose. Uh, E.O. Wilson says, let's leave half for other species because there are 100 million. We are just one species. That would be fair. So anyhow, that would then reduce kind of the amount of the capital that we, that we would use. How do we know how much we use compared to how much we have? It's pretty simple. Life is amazing. It's beautiful. It collaborates. And we eat each other. 
at the same time. So we compete. We don't just eat each other. We eat potatoes that I can eat and you can't eat it. Uh, or you eat a fish, I can't eat it. The seal eats the fish, we all can't eat it, etc. So we compete for ecological productivity. And in that way, I can say, okay, how much area is necessary for my potato, for my cotton, for my orange juice, for my CO2 sequestration, for all the services that I need for myself? And that's what we call the ecological footprint. We can just add up all these demands that compete for the biosphere and say, how much is that for me or for you or for Portugal? And because not every space is of equal productivity, we then can adjust each area for its relative productivity and to put it like everything put into dollars or into euros so you can compare currencies. You can also put all the physical things into similar kind of hectares to say how much is the value of a Costa Rican hectare, for example, to produce banana compared to an Alp in Switzerland. You know, so it's a, it's a way to compare and that's what we do. So it becomes the common unit is the global hectare and we can compare everything against everything else. I mean, not to the last degree, of, but pretty closely. And so that gives then this chart for the world, and you can do it for a person or for, the, for a farm, etc. What you see is that the ratio between the green line on top and the red line is about 1.7 currently. That means we are using the services of nature about 70% faster at least than what they renew. And that's about the same as to say we live as if we had 1.7 planets. And you can also translate that and say it's really if you, if you consume from January 1st to August 1st, as much as the planet can renew in the entire year. That's basically the same idea. And then the contrarians, they write in the newspaper on radio shows, particularly in the United States where I live, they say, I opened the fridge on August 2nd, and guess what? There was beer in the fridge. But the point is, it's like with money. You can spend more money than what you earn. No, so the same, you can, you can use more resources than regrow. We can deplete the stock, maybe you bought the beer before, you know, so it's, uh, you can build up stocks, you can still live off stocks. That's the whole point. You can. Uh, it's just, you can overuse for some time, but only for some time, and the question really is, it will balance out again, somehow. You know, you cannot over, like with money, you can't overuse. The question is, do you exit overshoot by design or by disaster? That's our choice. One planet prosperity, one planet misery. That's you choose. You can also calculate your own footprint. Some of you have done it. And then we also ask you to what extent you hap your, your happiness in your, in your life shows up. And that, that's what we saw as a result. This is the group here, a dot for those who did the test and said, okay, how big is my footprint? How happy am I? And what's interesting, it's even a slight negative correlation between happiness and footprint use. So it doesn't necessarily mean that resource demand makes you happier. Those are two different things. That's, just kind of, that's kind of good news. So we could go into details and find out from people here who are extremely happy and use very little footprint. What's the strategy? Or vice versa, those who have a very large footprint, very unhappy. What's going on? You know, so, so there are ways we can learn from each other. You can also look up your countries. That becomes more interesting to say how many Portugals does it take to support Portugal? I just saw the Minister of Environment here. Uh, he actually knew about it. It was interesting. Uh, how, how many does it take? It takes four Switzerlands, for example, to support Switzerland, where I'm from. Uh, all countries have very different shapes. We think it's one big common boat, but actually we are in very different boats. It matters what you do. The third misconception that, yes, resources are important, it's actually the living resources, and even more importantly, we also have to look at demand management. It's not just boosting supplies. But then people say, yeah, that's a good idea, but why should I do it? Because it's just good for humanity. People are convinced the world is going out of control, the Chinese and the Americans. I mean, it's just totally out of control. And then they say, why should I do something small, Argentina? Why should I do something small, America? Whatever the small is, you know? So, and that's kind of a strange conclusion because what's the business case of waiting to be squashed like a fly? I don't know. But people say that around the world. What can I do? And here I explain you what you can, what, why you can do something. And it's so absurd because it's a tautology. A tautology has no content. You know what tautology means? It's just a self 
referential statement, and people say, oh, really? And it goes like that. If you're not ready, you are not ready. <gasps> Me? Wow, how surprising. You know, so it's going, wow, okay, wow, strange. So, yes, it does matter what you do, for yourself, actually. Uh, now, when people say, yeah, I know, okay, it's important what we do for ourselves, uh, we have so many problems. We have, like, people aging, and we have obesity problems, and we have uh, traffic congestions, and we have whatever, you know. So, so, so many problems we have to deal with. Unemployment, why should we deal with resource issues? You know, that's kind of just, yeah, it's a risk, one among ten or one among hundred. And here is my point why I think it's a, it's a core driver. This is how the world looked like when I was born. Essentially, most countries were real true farms. They produced more than what people consumed on that particular farm called nation. Nations are like farms, they actually are farms. And so within just my lifetime, the situation has moved quite significantly, that now 85% of the world population live in countries that use more than what their ecosystems renew. Now there's another dimension that comes to it, and that's probably the most significant number I want to tell you, why, this is, why resource security is so significant. It is because when you have money, you can buy the difference. In Switzerland, we use four Switzerlands, we have a lot of income, so we just buy stuff from somewhere else, no problem. However, if you have less than world average income, how will you be able to buy more from the others than the others are able to buy from you? Do you get that? If you are higher than world income, then you can get more from the others than vice versa, but not the other way around. Currently, 70% of the world population live in countries that have an ecological deficit, and at the same time, less than world average income. Now, if the strategy is to double the income of everybody, guess what? They're still below average income. So the only way forward really is to put resource security at the core of what we do. So these are kind of from the misconception perspective, I think resources do matter. Biological resources are really significant. We need to work with demand as well. And um, in the end, it's about you. you know, there's a very strong self-interest case. Now, what can we do about it? And this is how I'm going to close. The question really is, should you believe me? And clearly the answer is no, because this is a scientific inquiry. You know? If I tell you there's gravity, don't believe me. Test it yourself. You know? I just, so, so test it. But then your bets will be more successful. You understand? By understanding the world better, you can make choices that more likely will turn out positively. And that's what we can learn also from planes, for example. Every 5,000th flight 100 years ago ended in death. Today, we fly around the world, and it's incredibly safe because we've learned these technical systems, we've improved them, we listen to feedback, and so we know what's significant to make systems work. And the same thing is true for a country or a company or a region or a city. What can we learn from that? Planes are quite complicated. They have a lot of dials you know, to fly. We've learned over time how to make them better. And the point really I want to make is that one key dial seems to be missing from countries and cities. It's this dial, the fuel dial. Without a fuel dial, flying for a few hours becomes quite scary. So by having it, it gives you a first indication. And that's what we do with Earth Overshoot Day. It's a first indication of where we are at. Uh, what does it help you to do? It's not just kind of to scare you. It's telling you maybe you want to get to a gas station in a metaphorical way. Uh, what's the gas station look like? We call it move the date. Move the date just means if we move the date five days into the future every year, we would already be below one planet before 2050. And we're working with a company called Schneider Electric. They do energy efficiency. Some of you may know the company. We calculate with them if we applied all the technological gizmos to the world in just the domain of housing efficiency and energy, uh, energy, renewable energy and grids, we could move the date today 21 days without losing comfort or financial gains. That's just using that, for example, just in those domains. Now, what does it mean specifically? Essentially, it's, it means two things. Everything you do has to be financially viable, otherwise it cannot be replicated, and also it has to help us move out of overshoot 
with every euro we spend. How do we do that? There are four key factors, and then I will stop. There are four key factors how you can do it. One is the way we build cities, like the Mediterranean cities, the compact cities where you can walk around that are not car dependent, are far more efficient to live in than, for example, in Atlanta or Houston that require enormous amount of traffic. A second factor is how we power ourselves. That's your specialty. Coal power versus solar power. I don't have to explain to you. A huge difference in demand on nature. And here an example uh, from Freiburg, Vauban. Some of you may have been there. It looks quite cute. Uh, we can live quite well. Now, what are the other factors? One is how we eat, obviously. You just talked about eating. Uh, about half of the planet's biocapacity currently is used just for food. If we are lower on the food chain, that makes a difference. Less food waste makes a difference. Uh, also, eating more locally makes a big difference. And then the last one builds on a very complicated mathematical model. I will try it out with you. Maybe you can follow. It goes, if you double the population, there's only half as much planet per person. Is that does that track? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. so, so population makes a big difference as well over time. It's a slow moving factor. And it's not to blame anybody, it's just to say if you truly feel committed to next generation having great opportunities, why don't we invest in having smaller families? And how does that work? Very simply, if women have the same opportunities that men had over the past, it gets much, much easier. Smaller families lead to better health outcomes, to better um, educational outcomes. There's really no downside. There are very quick social benefits from it, very quick. And then the ecological ones, very dramatic over time. It's a cumulative effect. I actually have something here that I want to share. For those who are daring, are, are there daring people here? I think so. There's a, a, an organization that does uh, biodiversity protection and they had these um, they, they had these little booklets here. So for example, I don't know how, if you understand Spanish. Salva al oso, no, salva al osito, ponte el corrito. It says, I don't know. So, so here, and, and then people can take it. And here it says, uh, before your seduction, think footprint reduction. So anyhow, so you can, you can look at those. Uh, I, I, I hand them out to the friends of my teenage son. It's, it produces very interesting conversation. They, they give it to their friends, and then they, their parents come to me and tell me about it. It's very interesting. Anyhow. <laughs> so uh, it's a topic that I think is important and a little bit under, underused. And I think if we truly want humans to, 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 th to thrive, we need to invest in women very aggressively. With that, I would like to close. And there's one particular word I would like to emphasize, and then I will shut up, because you want to have dinner, and I look forward myself. I'll be there, I'll be also there tomorrow, and look forward to have more conversations with you. People ask me, what's the one thing that you should suggest, we would suggest? What should we do? Uh, people don't want homework, but they ask you for homework, and then they don't like the homework. But yeah, so they ask me, what's the one thing that we should do? And if I only had one thing, I'd say, I would like you to bar one word in your vocabulary. And the word I would like you to bar in Orwellian way is should. I hear so many people say, we should do this or that. And what they really say is, I don't want to. So just substitute the word should with I want. And it feels very different. If you say, oh, we shouldn't have cities with cars. But then if you say, I want to live in a city without cars, totally different energy. And maybe you don't want that, then just don't say it. But if you really want it, then say it, because then suddenly we start to own it. The biggest lack we have is probably not resources, but the want to have a successful future. Perhaps if there's a second thing we could do, if you have a second thing you want to do maybe, then maybe you want to just bar the word sustainability, just say success. You know? What does it really take to be successful given there's one planet? And then people say, ah, it's, you don't want to take something away from me. No, I want a great, I want a great future. You know? And that's why I'm so thrilled to be here, because you will probably, many of you will be my age, and I hope you will be much, much more successful than me, because as I said, my pension really depends on you. So I, have, I want you to really, really, really do well. And I'm looking forward to our dinner today. 
and uh, to our conversations and your insights. Thank you very much.